Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Oxfirst panel discussion. My name is Adam Chaddock. Uh, we've got a really great panel of speakers for you today uh, with literally decades of collective experience in patent litigation, uh, and I'll introduce you to them in a moment. Uh, Oxfirst is an IP consultancy that's been operational since 2011. We perform IP valuations to assist businesses in unlocking the maximum value proposition from their portfolios. We provide expert analysis for litigation uh, and bespoke research projects with an IP focus. We're based in London. We maintain very close links with the University of Oxford uh, and lately the LSE as well. We publish regularly on the important IP matters of the day and we host webinars such as this one on a regular basis. To keep updated about those, please do take a look at our website or our LinkedIn page. Today's programme uh, will be about 45 minutes of semi-structured panel discussion where we'll hear from all of our speakers and the remainder of the time will be given over to, Q to a Q&A. You'll see at the bottom of the screen is the tab for the Q&A button. Please do enter some questions there. Myself and the panelists will be able to view it um, and we will get to those at the end. On to the substance then. Last week, the UPC published an almost complete list of judicial appointments. The function of this webinar is to flavour that discussion on the UPC as a crucial project for European and global patent litigation landscape. We're going to hear from leading lit litigators from Italy, France, and Germany. And we're gonna get a broad perspective on the UPC and the challenges, the opportunities, and perhaps some of the uncertainties that it, it has raised. With that said, onto our introductions. Uh, firstly, Vittorio. Vittorio Irelli is a partner at Trevisian and Cuanzo. He's an expert litigator with over 15 years of courtroom experience. He's represented companies before Italian and EU courts. Uh, and agencies on a, a range of high profile cases. His focus is on the interaction of IP and competition, uh, with a particular focus on litigating standard essential patents. He holds a PhD from the University of London. He's published extensively, and he's often called upon to give expert opinions on Italian law for foreign courts, which is really useful for us today. Our next speaker, Cyril Amar, is a French advocate and member of the Paris Bar since 2000. He co-founded Amar Grosser Staub in 2003, and he remains a partner there today. His practice likewise is focused on IP with specific experience in licensing and litigation relating to standard essential patents and FRAND agreements. Cyril is also founder of FRAND Avenue, which is a marketplace for licensing agreements. And last but not least, Ulrich Blumenroder is a partner at Grunecker, and he's counseled in all IP fields with a real focus on patent litigation over the last 20 years. He holds substantial experience for litigating patents from the telecommunication and consumer electronics sectors, uh, and he does so for clients from around the world. Ulrich is regularly published on a range of IP matters. He gives lectures on the German and European patent system, and he currently holds regular seminars on the UPC. With that being said, I'll hand over to Ulrich to start our discussion. Yeah, I'm very, very happy to be in the position to uh, to talk about that. Now, what uh, strikes us right from the beginning is uh, that there are a lot of uh, German judges uh, there uh, which have been identified by the UPC. Um, I, I do not really know whether that is justified, but um, um, that is that is not that much a question of of case law. I'm very comfortable about that. It's just the the mere dominance of, of German judges, which traditionally make feel others in Europe somewhat uncomfortable. So I I could have lived with uh, with a few number lesser German judges than we, we currently have, especially with the president of the Court of Appeals being German and, and also I think two Germans being on the presidium of the court. But be it as it be, um, those have been um, have been uh, found and uh, elected, so we will, we will, we will truly live with them. Uh, I I have uh, prepared for you um, um, some some minor slides, uh, which uh, I hope will will show up on on the screen here. 
and I have. Um, I hope you see my my slides only and not my my limited notes I I have here and I I started uh, scheduling or uh, sorting them uh, by divisions. Uh, perhaps the first surprise, at least to me, was uh, that uh, the court decided to stay with an all Düsseldorf local division, an all Munich, an all uh, Mannheim division. So we we don't have any mingling between Düsseldorf judges and uh, Munich judges or Mannheim and Hamburg judges, or Hamburg to some extent. So um, if I if I identify uh, them here and give you give you a little bit of of background of uh, what we look at, uh, the Düsseldorf local division uh, will consist of Ronnie Thomas and uh, uh, Miss uh, Miss Tom. Uh, of course, needless to say, they are very experienced. Uh, Ronnie Thomas uh, is, and I think has never been a presiding judge, uh, at least not in patent matters, but he is a long member in the Kuhn Senate. Many of you will will know Justice Kuhn from the Court of Appeals of Dusseldorf. Uh, very, very influential. Um, there is a handbook of, of him, uh, which um, practitioners sometimes call the Bible. We'll see what the UPC Bible will be, but um, if it goes for, for Germany, uh, everybody at least looks into that. And um, it is a lot, not only a lot of case law in there, but also a lot of opinion in there. So if you want to know how Thomas might, I have many exclamation marks behind that uh, rule or want to do rule in the future, that is the place to look. Ms. Thum is presiding judge of one of the three chambers of the court of Dusseldorf and uh, likewise very experienced. Interesting question is who will head the panel? Um, but I did not I did not see that that is decided, although it could be decided by uh, the president of uh, the court of first instance. Um, if there is no decision, the the panel itself uh, can vote or the presiding judge of the division can decide on that uh, for the time being. I think we don't know who will who will head uh, that uh, local division of Dusseldorf with an additional changing third judge and a technical judge. Similar situation in Munich. Uh, if you, many of you might know Mr. Zigan. Mr. Zigan has been very much pushing uh, the venue of Munich in the past years. He uh, will be um, presiding judge at the Court of Appeals, I think as of uh, November 1st or December 1st, very, very quickly. But he is not a, not a full-time judge, uh, but only part-time judge. So he will keep his, his national post. Uh, Mr. Piermeyer was out of the picture. Everybody thought he has left. He is doing antitrust, but he had been one of the presiding judge, judges of the chambers in Munich. Uh, he has started uh, uh, as a judge um, in the chamber of Mr. Zigan and has uh, become a presiding uh, judge, presiding his own chamber. They're both very very closely working together. So the policy we have there is is almost always structured by, uh, it appears to me, unanimous vote or under significant influence of Tsigan. Talking about what to keep in mind, Pichermeyer is the one who is very much in favor of deciding on preliminary injunctions on a case-by-case -case basis. There was bit of a fight between Dusseldorf and, and Munich in the last year. Uh, office talk says uh, that Munich is more inclined for preliminary injunctions than uh, than Dusseldorf. So you you might want to you might want to read um, the decision of CJEU on that on that issue. Um, 
similar situation of, in, in Mannheim. Uh, we have Tochtermann and Kircher. Uh, you see, I don't have a picture of, uh, of Mr. Kircher. Both currently had the two chambers uh, in charge of patents. Um, perhaps it is important to know for, I don't know whether Americans uh, listen, all the judges are fluent in English, but um, uh, Tochtermann uh, was a research assistant in Harvard, so uh, his English is probably the best. Uh, Mannheim takes pride in speed, uh, so I, I expect the two to comply with that and try to find decisions very quickly, both coming from Mannheim. Tochtermann uh, will be 100% UPC judge. Um, uh, there were rumors on that, but you can see that from the, uh, from the publication on the Unified Patent Court side. Uh, he will be in the presidium, so he, he has to be 100%, which will have some repercussions in, in Germany. There will be a lot of changes taking place in, in Germany because of so many judges changing. Hamburg is, is somewhat more difficult to assess. Many of you will, will know Ms. Klepsch, presiding judge uh, in um, Düsseldorf, uh, one of the three chambers very experienced, very long, for a very long time being uh, being presiding judge there, and she will be part of the local division in Hamburg. And in Hamburg, we have a, we have a surprise, or I'd say the first surprise. Mr. Schilling is a judge. Mr. Uh, Schilling does not seem to be very experienced in patent matters. He's not in the chambers in uh, in Hamburg doing doing patents. He has been a research assistant. So I will refrain from a lot of comments because I simply don't know Mr. Schilling. I have never pleaded uh, before him. So I have I have no idea even if I if I could comment on that. Uh, in terms of education, uh, Ms. Klebsch is not only a lawyer, uh, uh, she's a chemist as well. So uh, she might not need that much input uh, from a technical judge if it comes to chemical cases, but that might be one reason when having to decide where to go uh, to Hamburg uh, that you have a, a case in, in that field. So that gives the eight judges uh, for the local divisions in Germany. Strangely, Strangely enough, uh, the court decided to have a uh, permanent two judges and to identify the second judge for the respective local divisions. Uh, that was not necessarily the case, but uh, apparently the court decided to make that clear who the judges will be. But that is not the end of the, of the German judges. Uh, we have Ms. Foss, Central Division, uh, that branch in, in, in Munich. Uh, Ulrike Foss is a presiding judge. Formerly, she was a presiding uh, judge with the, no, not Court of Munich, Court of, sorry for, sorry for that, Court of Dusseldorf. Uh, and then she was promoted being preside, uh, presiding judge, Court of Appeals of Dusseldorf. She is an uh, infringement judge. Um, and um, she will now be part of the central division in in Munich. If we want to deduce something from that, it is it is probably that um, somebody in the preparatory committee expected that, uh, contrary to my personal expectations, uh, that there will be um, infringement cases also be handled. Uh, in the central division. And now somebody really new, Professor Hedeke. Germans know him. He's a university professor. He's no judge. 
He has been part-time judge with the Court of Appeals of Düsseldorf, but I think he is five years out of the job now. Uh, he will be in the Central Division in Paris. Uh, I'm sure he will be a, uh, an asset. Uh, he works as mediator, as an arbitrator. He is called in as an expert. That will probably die. Uh, so uh, that was that was not expected, and I I do not quite know why that has happened. But that does not uh, say anything about his qualification. I'm I'm very uh, certain that he will be good in his job. Last slide on uh, the German judges that can make uh, court of appeals. We have Mr. Grabinski. Uh, most of you will will know. Uh, he will be president. Uh, he uh, whether he will uh, be head of uh, the first panel. I don't know, but he's the co-drafter of the rules of procedure. Currently, uh, second, uh, tenth uh, Senate of uh, the Supreme Court. So that is no surprise at all. Everybody had expected that. Ms. Rombach is is more um, uh, of a surprise. He, uh, she had a tremendous career, uh, becoming. Uh, presiding judge of one of the chambers in Mannheim, then moving to antitrust, now being in the 13th Senate for antitrust, and now being in the Court of Appeals uh, due to her patent background, yes, but uh, we'll discuss that perhaps also because of her antitrust background. Here on the slides we have here two slides um, i don't want to go into the name i just want to highlight uh all patent attorneys and uh we have uh judges from the german federal patent court in biotech in chemistry not in electricity mechanical engineering and here in physics and um i'm sure we will have some something to speak of that as well, including Mr. Wilhelm, who still works with 3M and who is nonetheless uh, a technical judge and will sit on the bench. I suggest, um, I, I take it there will be some questions on the German judges, but I suggest that we postpone that uh, to the end of our little webinar and um, perhaps continue with the Italian and, and French judges and um, perhaps have then or at the end a Q&A session. If, uh, if uh, Vittorio and Cyril, if you, if you agree on that. Sure. Who's next? Oh, okay, Stram, I think that was, sorry, yeah. So that's that's the French judges. That will be short. Um, first, I don't have uh, I haven't prepared slides. Well, the the, the we have five uh, professional magistrates, French magistrates, which have been who have been appointed. Um, one of them uh, will uh, preside the court of first instance, Mrs. Barutel, and um, two of them will be. They are all women, by the way, which is uh, not unusual uh, among French judges. Um, two of them will preside, will will be, of course, in the local division in Paris, and two others in the um, central division, uh, first instance, one of them in Paris, the other, Madame Besso, in uh, Munich. Um, they, they all have a very, I would say, classical uh, background, uh, purely lawyers. Um, we, like any other French judges, they, they, must be, they must be assigned to new positions every five or six years. Uh, so um, we, we can't know them very well. Uh, like, like in other countries where judges stay uh, longer um, in, in their jurisdiction. Uh, however, 
all of them have a solid experience in patent matters. They have all uh, seated in the third uh, chamber of the Paris Court, Court of First Instance, which is dealing with patent matters, or, and sometimes and, um, within the chamber of the Paris Court of Appeal, which is also dealing with patent matters. So they are all good lawyers with experience in patent law. I cannot um, tell you how their, uh, what are their skills in speaking foreign languages. Um, I suppose Madame Besso speaks German since she will go to uh, Munich and others uh, should be uh, relatively fluent in, in English. Um, then we have um, 12 or 13, depending upon, um, you know, there's one of them who is a B national, uh, German and French. Um, so we have uh, 12 or 13 technically qualified judges. They are all, they have all have an impeccable uh, background, um, solid experience, uh, excellent professionals. They, um, for, for two of them, um, have a dual um, competence. They are both uh, former engineers um, and uh, patent attorneys, and then they moved to be avocat lawyers. Two of them are in-house. Um, one is uh, leading the um, IP department of the US company, Bose. The other one having a senior position uh, within Orange, the um, telecommunication operator. And others are mostly um, patent attorneys um, from Paris, Lyon, Toulouse. They, um, again, I mean, they are all experienced. Their average age is um, uh, something like 45. Um, and um, there's only one woman um, who is um, specializing in uh, chemistry and pharmaceuticals. Others are mostly in uh, uh, mechanics and uh, physics. Electricity. Um, that's, this is all I, I can say about them. Um, you know, everything remains to be seen apart from that. Vittorio, that's... Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's start with numbers again. Um, Italians are a fairly numerous group, the third most numerous group uh, within the nominated judges, there are 11, four legally qualified judges and seven technically qualified judges. They are the third most numerous groups after uh, Germans who are 28, and if I'm not wrong, and French, as you say, 17. So uh, let's start with the legally qualified judges first. Uh, we had one appointment at the Court of Appeal, uh, Ms. Germana. Uh, she's a very experienced judge. She has been for more than 20 years at the AP Chamber of the Court of Turin, first in first instance, and then she's been presiding in the uh, IP Chamber of the Court of Appeals uh, of Turin. Then we have an appointment at the Central Division of the Court of First Instance. Uh, it's uh, named, the name of the judge is uh, Mr. Paolo Catalozzi. And by the way, contrary to France, uh, the uh, Italian legally qualified judges ensure uh, an equal uh, representation of genders. We have two uh, men and two women. So Paolo Catalozzi is at the Central Division. He current, they are all part time, by the way. Uh, so uh, Paolo Catalozzi sits. Uh, currently at the IP chamber of the, of the Supreme Court, the division which is responsible for IP matters at the Supreme Court. In the past, he's been sitting uh, at the IP chamber of the first instance uh, uh, district court of Rome, uh, where he uh, handled a number of trade secret and public cases uh, in, his, in his chamber. Um, 
but I would say that the uh, most of the curiosity of the community was about the uh, judges who would have been appointed uh, for the Milan local division, uh, which is of course, uh, especially for the Italian community, an extremely important, uh, extremely important appointments. And I can say that I mean, expectations were not were not disappointed. The two uh, judges have been named are. Uh, both uh, probably the best possible choice. They're both coming from, from Milan, where they've been sitting at the first instance uh, court in the AP chamber for, for 10 years. They are both in their early 50s. Uh, their, their name is uh, uh, Judge Perlotti and Judge uh, Zana. So again, a man and, and a woman. They've been working together in the IP chamber for, for many years. They've been sitting as judges there for basically a large part of their uh, position uh, at the IP chamber. And they have, have handled uh, several of those inspiring cases each, uh, very often sitting in the same panel, uh, where Conor Piat was presiding judge. Um, we, I mean, I've already attended a number of, of Conference organized in Milan, and, that, and, and there is uh, I mean, a lot of confidence that uh, they are an excellent appointment, and uh, no doubt they will make the Milan court um, a success. Uh, there is a lot of comfort in having such experienced judges sitting there. Um, the, um, turning to the technically qualified judges, we have seven uh, Italian qualified judges. Uh, which is uh, a big number, uh, probably a reflection of the fact that uh, pilot attorneys typically play a significant role in Italian patent litigation. As everyone who is uh, experiencing Italian patent litigation knows they are often appointed as advisors to the court for uh, technical matters. And all the three, all the seven, sorry, technically qualified judges do have a lot of experience as uh, advisors to the uh, to the Italian courts in, in patent litigation. Uh, I can go through the names, uh, but I think it's most more important to know the technical background. We have uh, a chemist, the name is um, Mr. Jelly. Then we have uh, three coming from the electricity, IT. Uh, they are listed in different categories, but they are all active in IT. At, at the IT markets, typically, their names are uh, Sanchini, Schilletta, and um, Peronace. And then we have uh, two mechanical engineers. So um, I think uh, this triggers probably um, a nice uh, discussion that we can have uh, later on about the role that technical judges will play at the UPC uh, on a number of dimensions. Um, but before that, uh, I wonder whether uh, there is anything that can be triggered in terms of immediate comments from the names we have heard and the background we have, we have heard in relation to the legally qualified judges. One immediate comment I feel like can make right now is that we have, and it, it is interesting to see a certain uh, experience, not only with patents, but also with antitrust matters. Uh, Ulrich mentioned the background of uh, Judge Ron, but she's not the only one with an antitrust background. Also, the, and, I understand also the Swedish appointment as a, as a very strong antitrust uh, background. I do not personally know the judge, but I'm told she's uh, I mean, an antitrust expert, uh, Judge Simonson. And the same is true for the Italian judges, for um, basically institutional reasons. The IP chambers in Italy also have competence over antitrust matters. There is no divided competence like in Germany. So all the Italians have uh, quite a strong uh, experience and track record in handling uh, complex uh, private enforcement uh, litigation, which is um, probably an interesting uh, point to know. Uh, the UPC will have uh, the I mean, significant expertise also in, in antitrust matters. I don't know whether uh, Rick, you, you feel you can share anything else 
I, I think you have made a very good point because uh, indeed, well, we all know that there are many, uh, you know, overlap between anti antitrust law and IP law in many aspects. Um, the brand issues being one of them. Uh, but there's also, um, in my experience, I've seen uh, in antitrust matters, cases, um, judges are well versed in the indemnification, in the complex economics, economic cal calculations and indemnification methods. Uh, and that's good news because uh, it's very often complex matters. And it's very good to know that we have uh, judges in uh, the UPC who will be accustomed to uh, these uh, complex, um, you know, calculations and methods. Uh, in, I think it re it reflects a certain expectation uh, of those having having appointed the judges, at least from a German perspective. Uh, you you have mentioned Fran Vittorio the standard essential patent cases um, are more and more important. And if I hear, if I talk to clients, it is often that field uh, where clients say, well, okay, we will go with at least one or two patents to the UPC, uh, testing the waters there. And that seems to be the assessment um, of the preparatory committee um, as, as well. Germany had um, um, a patent uh, Senate uh, with a Supreme Court where, where all the patent related cases uh, were, were handled. The last two friend cases, uh, very brilliant um, names with a lot of fantasy, friend one and friend two, uh, they have been assigned to the antitrust Senate. So well, I think that is that is nice um, that that there is somebody giving giving the view of of German antitrust there in light of Ms. Rombach and she will be impeccably prepared. Um, and we have a we have a second one with uh, Mr. Pichelmeier, but um, that goes only goes only for for Munich. And so the, I, I just think that uh, there will be a lot of uh, a lot of cases uh, being handled by the UPC, which which also involve antitrust law. And what about the, the role of the court of the court of appeals? The it will certainly have very important role at the very beginning uh, from discussions uh, ahead with uh, judges that we now know are in the court of appeals of the UPC. Uh, we can expect that in the early days it will uh, often exercise its discretion under the rules of the agreement to hear uh, appeals also without waiting for for the final decisions but on on, on procedural matters and uh, and uh, it is very well likely that uh, a lot of uh, decision on evidence especially in front of the cases will Will require might trigger uh, intense discussion between the parties and the need to identify what type of evidence taking is needed in uh, in the UPC. Do you think this is a pattern that can be expected in, uh, at the Court of Appeal? I I would tend to assume so. Uh, strong role of the Court of Appeal even in the early days, even in procedural matters. I mean, we may be proved wrong. Well, Cyril, I, I, I expect, oh, let's put it, uh, let's look at it from another angle. It's the job of the Court of Appeal uh, to, uh, to streamline the case law of the UPC. Um, and um, as such, I, 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 I request, I, I would wish that um, the court indeed takes as many cases as possible uh, in in order to fulfill that uh, that objective. Uh, that means that I think in the cases uh, where there is no formal appeal, but it is upon discretion of the Court of Appeals whether to take it or not, mm -hmm. I, I will 
uh, I'm inclined to um, to assume that they take it. And if you if you look at the at the at the list of um, of those at the Court of Appeals, these are these are really I I can only judge with respect to Germany. And if I if I they're, they're at the prime of uh, of what there is in terms of experience, uh, in terms of 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 knowledge or let's say reputation. Uh, if I read Mr. Block and Mrs. Calden um, from the Netherlands, I, I can not say anything about what they do, but those are the two judges from the Netherlands I know. The other ones I don't know. And uh, at least with respect to Ms. Calden, I, I'm, I re recently suffered a very daring uh, decision, which I can, of course, consider to be wrong uh, because I'm on the defense side, but... Um, from from that i i take it she will not be shy to make decisions and uh, shy to to push forward a streamlined uh, uh case law of the of the court so really any any well, expectations from from Strasbourg i it's it's always very difficult because um well the the I can only have figures, you know, the affirmation rate uh, at mm -hmm. the fifth the chamber where she was sitting is very much the same as like in any other chamber. Uh, two thirds of, of the uh, first instance decisions are affirmed. Um, it's, um, and since it is collegial decisions, you never know who has ruled in which way. Um, it's very difficult to say, basically, most, if not all, I would say nine, more than 95% of the first instant decisions are uh, then appealed, usually. Uh, and, and so I, I share your views. The, the Court of Appeal in the UPC will streamline, will, will really make uh, the, 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 the law, the case law. It's hard to, uh, you know, to predict how it will uh, and where it will go exactly. Mm -hmm. That remains to be seen, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it. That's what I can say. Let's start to technical judges. I think they are one of the uh, big um, um, I mean, no, none of us is used to technical judges in the way uh, they will uh, participate to the activity of the court. And uh, there are a few uh, I mean, it would be very interesting to see how the dynamics will evolve in terms of the role of technical judges within the division. I think there are, there are some assumptions and some, uh, and some factors that we can derive from the agreement. The first one is that, uh, I mean, even though uh, in certain jurisdictions their role might be perceived as uh, um, possibly less significant than that of the legally qualified judges in the rules and in the agreements. Uh, it is provided that they participate in the deliberation, they vote, and they, uh, they, they sit as judges in the, in the panel. Uh, also, uh, there is the possibility for the parties uh, to request the appointment of a technically qualified judges in every case uh, they see fit. Uh, in addition to the fact that the participation of a technical qualified judge is compulsory in a number of um, type of actions uh, when validity is at stake, uh, basically. Um, so we can, I think, fairly predict that, I mean, knowing how litigation is handled, there will be very often, if not always, at least one of the parties who will think that uh, it would be good to, I mean, change uh, a little bit uh, the uh, pattern that is in front uh, of, uh, of himself and request uh, the appointment of a technically qualified judge to, to see if uh, it might improve for one reason or another uh, the chances of success if perceived that before that specific panel, which means that technically qualified judges will probably very often be called uh, to participate to the uh, to the activity of the uh, acting division. 
Uh, and there is no discussion by the court, by the way, if uh, one of the parties requests the appointment of a technically qualified judge, that technically qualified judge has to be, has to be appointed. Um, what but I think is... that is a that is a fair point. I, I've I've just looked uh, looked into the the, the questions, and um, uh, one of uh, one of them is 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 more blunt, more blunt than we probably dare to respond to. How can it be ensured that technical judges are really independent as they are themselves involved in litigation? That is just yeah, yeah there here we go. Um, <laughs> yes. Let me add just yes. one point, and I think Cyril can take the lead on that, and then we will follow through. This is one of the points we've been discussing, of course. It's one of the big issues in front of all of us. Um, but I just wanted to make that uh, technical judges will play a role. Probably this role will be dependent on the, uh, on the also background of the other judges uh, being part of the, of the panel, and it may vary on appeal and on first instance, you may prepare across the division, but we can fairly uh, easily predict that this is one of the factors that would be considered when devising strategies. Also because there are a lot of potential manners to, um, to increase the chances of having one technical judge rather than another, like especially if you go to uh, divisions where uh, the language of the proceedings is not English, but it's another language that might be spoken fluently by a subset of technical judges. I'm thinking of Milan, for example, but also Sweden or, or Denmark. Uh, and this will certainly play, I think, uh, a big role in, uh, in the years to come. Uh, but let's, uh, let's address the, 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 the the elephant here. Uh, Siri, what do you want? Yeah. What do you want to answer the question? If if someone does get into trouble, let's be uh, uh, okay. I volunteer. Um, clearly, the technical judges. Uh, I mean, the idea of having technical judges being part of the panels is something which will make the UPC quite distinct from um, the other courts, especially in France, where. As you all know, well, in all countries are, except Germany, where infringement and validity are decided altogether. And clearly, uh, we have all experienced uh, these difficult issues, especially on validity, where uh, I have often wished, uh, you know, a technically qualified judge would be uh, pleading with me first and could be so on the other side with the judges, helping them understanding complex, these very complex matters. So I do not, I, I believe, I personally believe that this choice which has been made by, um, you know, uh, the, the, the member states when they chose to ratify this uh, treaty was an excellent choice. And this is something I'm firm, a firm believer in this. When we have seen the the, the, the list of technically qualified judges published, I think clearly a debate has started in, in, in the few past days, a number of articles have been published, um, which all have raised a, a number of issues, difficult issues, such as conflicts of interest. And I see in the questions that these questions are also raised in, in our audience, and we should address them uh, because that's a very important issue because the UPC must succeed. I mean, we cannot jeopardize uh, this very important um, progress in our field of activity, but beyond, I mean, that's, let's keep in mind that this is the first time that we have a common court in Europe, and this is not something that we can, we, we can't fail. So this is an extremely important matter, and this court must render justice in a way which will be respected globally, worldwide. We must lead and sh by example. And I'm afraid that the way the technically qualified judges have been appointed, but more precisely, um, there is a, an ambiguity today uh, about what will be their role. Will they be able to, 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 to be clear Will they be able to plead to represent parties before 
the court to which they belong? Will they be able to address the court saying, my dear colleagues, here's my case. Will they be able to defend or advise a party who will be litigating before the court to which they belong? We have seen in the treaty and in the statute that there are provisions which deal with conflicts of interest. And I must insist on the fact that I am not suspecting or you know, assuming that any of the very distinguished professionals who have been um, uh, appointed, um, you know, could use or could use their newly new powers uh, for another interest than the interest of justice. I'm just saying that by definition, there would be a conflict of interest and something which would lead to, you know, being for our clients, for the parties to be suspicious, if they would see um, one of the judges being the counsel of their opponent of the other party in front of his or her colleagues. That would, in my view, uh, trigger uh, debate, polemists, um, questions which would you know lead this fantastic experience of the UPC to fail inevitably and that's why I knowing that uh, the rules concerning the conflicts of interest and how the, the technically qualified judge remain to be adopted within the UPC before the UPC will open its doors I, I am urging and I'd like to know in the audience if there are any questions. I'm urging the competent authorities to take the to 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 clarify the rules, which will govern you know the activity of the technically qualified judges uh, as councils or in uh, representing the, the the parties before the UPC. I must also say, in response to one of the questions, uh, who is saying you know. Uh, would marketing the activity of technical judges should, should it not be forbidden? But we have seen, you know, in in the hours following the, the announcement, the publication of the list, that many technically qualified judges have published on their own websites, you know, some news informing their clients that they were appointed. And of course, that raises issues, and I would kindly um, refer the audience to um, the, the case law that we have in Europe, um, which stem from Article 6, 1 of the Re European Convention of Human Rights, which is incorporated into the, uh, uh, the, the law of the Union, the main principles, uh, for fair trial. And under those rules, justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. This is, um, you know, a, a principle that comes that is applicable to in every country. And I question whether a decision that would have been rendered by a panel with very distinguished judges, having cleared all their conflicts of interest in accordance with the rules, in a case where one of the parties would have been represented by one of their colleagues. Can we say in such a case that justice can be seen to be done? That's the question I have, which I hope will be debated in the following days and weeks in order to be very careful about the rules that will be adopted within the UPC governing the right of representation and assistance of the technically qualified judges in their professional life. And again, I don't want to uh, question the probity the, uh, and the professionalism of, of um, these uh, esteemed colleagues.
uh, I'd like to have I, your I, views. I love your your um, I love your your speech, and it it reflects what we have been quarrelling before that. And I I read the the comments and and questions. Uh, is the function of part time judges compatible with the constitution of the contracting states of the UPC? Um, the number of recusal, refusals of technically judges might nonetheless be really hard, or could it not be a Pyrrhus uh, victory if somebody actually uh, published uh, that uh, that he or she has become uh, a technical judge? Um, usually, uh, usually in a discussion or in a presentation, we should not contradict each other. Others, <laughs> but uh, here for life, uh, livelihood matters. I, I, I will be blunt on that. Um, it may all be correct. Two caveats. Firstly, that especially German patent attorneys um, should become technical judges and, and taking it for granted that they would continue to work. That is something which has been on the docket for over seven years now. And uh, we, we didn't address that, but uh, spoke about uh, lawyers being in the advisory committee uh, which uh, might render the legally qualified judges uh, uh, to be biased. So, so I I think that that will be that will be a non-legal argument, uh, which will be put forward by by people thinking that the system okay is okay. Um, but nonetheless, I think that one will be significant. But more than that. Um, I have been sending um, a little text messages to my law student daughter and saying, hey, is Switzerland um, um, a signer of, uh, of the Menschenrechtskonvention? And she said, why don't you look it up yourself? I don't know by heart. I said, I'm the speaker in a webinar, would you please? <laughs> okay, Switzerland, according to my daughter, signed uh, in 1974. They have that system of patent attorneys being part-time judges, continuing to work, continuing to plead in court. They somehow deal with that. And I, I think we, we might want to look into that in, in order to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. I think it becomes clear by one of, uh, one of the technical judges coming from Orange. I mean, they, they cannot sit on the bench uh, when it or plead, do both when it goes uh, against other telecom giants in the world. The, the conflict can be grasped. Uh, the same might be with uh, with somebody uh, from Airbus. I, I, for, I forgot one of the uh, technical judges here. When it goes against Boeing, yeah. uh, that's just impossible. And perhaps we can establish a, a similar structure. Uh, if it comes to patent attorneys having a large client like Samsung, um, they they cannot have any decisive role if it goes against Apple. I think, Uli, that what you are saying here is perfectly relevant to the rules of conflict of interest. And there is no doubt that uh, under Article 7 of the Treaty and 17 of the Statute, yes, there are rules governing the conflict of interest. And those rules would obviously prohibit uh, the gentleman from Orange to seat uh, on a bench if, you know, a, a company who has relationship with Orange would, would be litigating whatever the matter. And this would apply equally to councils for their respective clients and we all know that sometimes it's quite difficult to check conflicts because we all know that, you know, the groups, that's difficult. Anyway, I think that this is not a conflict of interest issue. Well, it, it is, but it's a conflict of interest with res vis a vis your duties as an independent judge. Mm -hmm. Because what would be, you know, the reaction of a competitor of Bose? or Orange, Nokia, Agfa Gewerz, those companies mm -hmm. who have employees within the list of technically qualified judges, who would have a litigation, not necessarily involving those companies, but in this field, 
can they really believe that the court is fully independent when uh, you know an officer of their com competitor is sitting with the same judges who will be deciding their case that's the point you know does it give the appearance of impartiality that is necessary under Article 6.1 of the European Convention. And by the way, I've checked the case law under uh, uh, this Article 6.1. Um, the, the Swiss very specific situation wasn't referred to um, this court because and the, the, that court can only rule on matters which, which are brought to it. But there have been a, a number of other cases where what has been quashed or punished by this court in Strasbourg was the fact that the court independence wasn't questioned, but the appearance of its lack of independence mm -hmm. was questionable. And that's what we can't afford. We cannot afford the UPC not appearing independent, not being far from any conflict of interest. So we all understand that this is a temporary situation. That's the good news, because if the, the UPC is successful, then hopefully there will be full-time technically qualified judges, and that will be fine. We won't have this issue anymore. But pending this you know, future situation, how do we how can we deal with that? And my view is that, well, that's very clear. Um, people can't appear, can't uh, represent, and can't advise. They have to make a choice. They are judges, but there are plenty of other work for them in different matters, just as they do today, yeah. different courts. So I, 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 I do take it that um, that, that is um, an issue which will uh, quite rapidly be considered uh, by, by the Court of Appeals, because I think uh, th th that uh, that is an objection which uh, which goes or at least can go to the Court of Appeals right away. Um, I'm I'm not yeah. sure whether there are enough independent uh, independent no uh, that's the point. Uh, technical judges being available. There are two comments on that, Ulrich. I think that uh, what she really is saying is that. Uh, we know that this code of conduct is being um, currently uh, drafted. It's not yet uh, available. Uh, that I mean, it's raising the awareness on, on looking very carefully at this issue. Uh, but also the other comment uh, Cyril made, I think it's, it's very important, um, which is the fact that this is a, probably a temporary solution. I've spoken with a number of technical judges in Italy, and, uh, and the, the, the difficult situation they face is that it is very difficult to predict what the volume uh, will be, the you know, indication of what uh, to expect in terms of, of case law from the court. And it's also interesting to know that they are paid based on, on, on cases handled, contrary to the legally qualified judges that have. Uh, uh, basically a fixed salary that varies depending on whether you are full-time or part-time. Technically qualified judges would be remunerated on the basis of the cases they handle for the UPC. And there is no visibility on, on anything like that. And, uh, and I see the difficulty on the one hand ensuring the uh, financial liability of the court in a situation of uncertainty like this one. And on the other hand, the understandable concerns raised by, by Sri. So it's a typical situation where balance will need to be struck and hoping that in the future uh, there will not be there will no longer be a, a need for uh, striking a balance because there will be many cases and uh, all full-time judges with, with no reason for that. One other important comment to make is that we often kind of confuse technically qualified judges with the figures we're used to, uh, court-appointed experts in Italy or other forms of advisors to the court, whilst they would be judges. And uh, as one of the comments was uh, mentioning, constitutional rules in many countries are fairly strict. 
in terms of uh, what a judge can do and cannot do if before the uh, district where he uh, administers justice. And, uh, and those rules will have to be considered probably by the, by the administrative committee to avoid issues going forward. Yeah. Yes. So we 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 see that this is in indeed a, um, an an important topic from the from the number of uh, from the number of comments I see, I see here um, that it is uh, it is probably more we can we can cover without extending for another hour or two, but uh, but I think uh, the three of us all agree if you if you have specific questions on that. Don't don't hesitate to send us emails. I I think they're they're easily easily accessible. Uh, Adam, do we have uh, time for for commenting on on a on another question which have been raised, or do you prefer to open the panel to to live discussion? Uh, I think we can we can open it up perhaps just for five more minutes. Um, mm -hmm. If if there are any final comments from the audience as to questions that they want answered, please do put them in the box there. Good. Perhaps while you do so, I, I have seen one one question uh, which which deals with UPC validity case law versus EPO uh, validity decisions. Um, we can we can hardly give a uh, give a proper assessment on that. Uh, it strikes me that uh, patent attorneys in biotech and uh, and electricity that they, they, they might uh, might be more orientated to, to, to the EPO and be inclined to follow more the the OP, EPO case law. Uh, there are some judges from, and I'm only concern, concerned about German law here from the Federal Patent Court. Um, they are a little bit more picky. Uh, so one might say about obviousness and invalidate more. Uh, so you, you can do guesswork in in that field, but in the long run, I'm I'm quite certain that the fact that um, the the EPC, UPC agreement explicitly refers uh, to uh, to the EPO and uh, the EPC uh, that it is more that case law which which will prevail. And if I had a comment on that, Ulrich, uh, again, I think, um, uh, of course, it would be the Court of Appeal that uh, has an organizing function uh, across uh, division. But we know that very often part of the um, job is done in first instance. Uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, difficult to change the tide on certain technical uh, aspects on a field. And again, uh, the um, background and the manner in which uh, judges from different jurisdictions are used to work vary. Uh, I can give the example of technically qualified judges in Italy who are very much used to adopt quite closely the um, EPO uh, case law and uh, and, and guidelines, which in turn reflects in a certain uh, um, um, I mean, invalidation rate that is slightly lower than in other jurisdictions uh, due to this uh, factor. And, um, and this is again, uh, something which might play out uh, at the UPC and answering these questions in the abstract might be even more difficult. Just wanted to add that to this comment. I think that's a good place to draw this to a close. Uh, thank you very much to all of our panelists for your time uh, and for your expertise. For our audience, I hope you found that useful, maybe a little bit provocative as well. Um, I'll take this chance just to highlight to you another webinar that we have coming up soon uh, on the UPC next week, in fact, with uh, Dr. Angela Brambink there, as you can see. Um, that will no doubt build on some of the themes that we've touched on today uh, and might be very interesting. Details are on the website. They're also on our LinkedIn page. Um, with all that being said, thank you very much for your time today uh, and we wish you a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
拜拜。